So I am on my way to watch Oppenheimer. And in preparation for watching this film, I am actually listening to a 26 hour audiobook on Oppenheimer. And somewhere around chapter 15 of the book, it mentions that Oppenheimer spent an entire summer trying to calculate whether this reaction of the nuclear bomb will engulf the entire atmosphere and set it on fire. I think we should first talk about how a basic fission reaction actually works. So suppose that you have an isotope of uranium, say uranium-235, and when the neutron collides with this uranium-235, it forms a very unstable isotope called uranium-236. Now since this uranium-236 is very unstable, it breaks down into more stable nuclei. But at the same time, it also emits neutrons and a tiny amount of heat. Now this heat might not be very significant by itself. But when you consider just how many atoms there are in a very small amount of uranium, things pile up very, very quickly. Okay, so I think we should first talk about the bomb. At its core is plutonium in the form of a sphere. Now if you have this plutonium in enough quantity, this can trigger a nuclear chain reaction, thereby emitting immense energy in the capacity of thousands and thousands of TNT. But the problem was that even though plutonium was a synthetic material, it still was very, very scarce. And so the team at Manhattan Project came up with something very interesting. Instead of using the absolute critical mass of plutonium, they figured out that if somehow we can increase the density of plutonium, its critical mass will decrease. And how do we increase the density? By compressing it. Now the compression is kind of tricky because it has to be very symmetric in all directions. So just by using shock waves from the explosives, it would not be enough because it would compress it in a very asymmetrical manner. So they came up with this concept of fusing slow and fast explosives together in order to generate a much more symmetrical shock wave. So now you have a plutonium core and then you have a way to somehow compress it together. Another tool that they used to accelerate this nuclear chain reaction was a little bit of beryllium and polonium right in the middle of the plutonium core. What it actually did was that when the shock waves actually came in, the beryllium and polonium would fuse together and thereby releasing a plethora of neutrons. This would then kickstart the nuclear chain reaction, releasing massive amounts of heat as a result. Okay, I think it is time that we start talking about why Oppenheimer thought that this was gonna set the world on fire. No longer any doubt about it. That uranium is splitting into at least two big parts. So in principle, what they feared was that the heat from the fission reaction, when it interacts with the atmosphere, would fuse together some very light elements. So when two elements fuse together, an amount of heat is generated there as well, only much larger. So the concern that Oppenheimer and team had very briefly was the fact that what if the heat from the fission bomb, when it interacts with the atmosphere, fuses the elements of the atmosphere, thereby triggering a chain of reactions which would probably set the whole atmosphere on fire. It's a very daunting sci-fi-esque probability thing that's probably never gonna happen. But in those early stages of the development of nuclear energy, nothing could have been ruled out. So in more technical terms, as you can see, they were concerned about nitrogen fusing together to produce this magnesium. 
Now, if that would have happened, the whole atmosphere would have just been a big hot plasma. So they tried to calculate the energy that is produced when, say, nitrogen is fused together. And it's actually based on the density of the nitrogen in that region of the atmosphere and the energy produced by the fission bomb. But there's another component over here. This is actually the probability of fusion. Now, obviously, they knew about what energy would be produced with the bomb. They also knew about the density of nitrogen in the air. What they did not have any data on was just how probable it is for nitrogen to fuse together. So they considered the worst thing possible and decided that every collision would result in a fusion, which is not the case at all. But just for the sake of being extremely safe, this is what they proceeded with. Now let's call this thing as the energy gained during fusion. Or to be more specific, the energy gained per nucleus per second. So when you plot this energy gain with like nuclear temperature, you see this curve arising. So the higher the nuclear temperature, the more the energy gained. But during this nuclear reaction, the energy is not just gained, but lost as well. The reason being that at temperatures where fusion actually occurs, the electrons are set free from the nucleus. And when they are set free, they're taken away by the ions of the atmosphere, thereby radiating energy all across. So if you plot that against the rising temperature graph, we would see a curve emerging like this. Now, I think the most eloquent part about this whole study was the fact that it all depended on two lines intersecting. So if the energy gained during fusion were to ever overtake the energy lost during fusion, the whole atmosphere would have just been set on fire. The fate of this entire world, this whole civilization, would have been dependent on two lines intersecting each other. But fortunately, that never happened. And even though the curves did come close, it was never close enough. And that is because the energy that is needed from a fission reaction to generate that sort of temperature is just not possible. So as you might think that this concept of creating fusion through fission was rather absurd. Or was it? Thank you for watching this one-off episode. I have to now go back to work on the series. Hopefully I'll see you soon.